Welcome back, everybody, for another deep dive. This time, we're going to be talking all about the science of human development. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, I know. It's all about understanding how and why people change over time. And honestly, going through this chapter, I already have tons of questions. I feel like it's really going to make us think. For sure. And this chapter really lays a good foundation for us. It emphasizes that you know studying human development it's not just about like watching kids grow up it's like an actual science right that uses research methods oh yeah the scientific method yeah that's what intrigued me too right away like yeah. how do you even apply something as structured as the scientific method right to something as messy and unpredictable as people exactly yeah that's a great question and the chapter really dives right into it it walks us through how researchers use things like observation experimentation even surveys oh wow to gather evidence and really test their hypotheses about how people develop oh so it's like it's not just sit back and watch people no. it's actually like testing things it's actively testing ideas looking for patterns. Mm -hmm. And one study that really got me thinking was this one about priming and soccer hooligans. Okay, now those two words don't usually go together. They don't, but it's so interesting. So researchers in the Netherlands were trying to understand how you know our thoughts and expectations can influence our actions. Okay, yeah. So they primed some students to think of themselves as either like professors or like hooligans. Oh my God. And then they had them answer some trivia questions. Okay, did the hooligans like start a fight in the lab? No, not okay. quite. But here's the thing. The students who were primed to think like professors, they actually scored way higher on the trivia than the hooligans. No way. So like if you're about to take a test, just imagine yourself as a brainy professor. Right, exactly. You'll ace it. It suggests that even these subtle cues can really shape our behavior in surprising ways. That is wild. But here's where it gets even more interesting. When other researchers tried to replicate this study, they couldn't get the same result. Yeah, so it sparked a lot of debate about, you know, how reliable priming effects really are. And the importance of replicating studies. Oh, that's so interesting. To make sure you know that they're valid. It's like science has a built-in, like, checks and balances system. Yeah. Where you have to double check and make sure that things are accurate. Absolutely. And that's where this idea of meta-analysis comes in. I love that word. It's so cool. I don't know why. It's a fancy word, but all it means is you're combining the results of multiple studies. Oh, okay. To get, like, a bigger picture understanding. Oh, so it's like taking the best ingredients from different recipes. Exactly. Wow. And then, you know, making this amazing gourmet dish. And you're a meta-analysis chef. That's me. That's awesome. Yeah. Another study I found interesting was the one about Thanksgiving and political polarization. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. It's wild to think that, like, where your family lives politically could influence, like, how long you stay at Thanksgiving dinner. I know. It's crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. So they use smartphone location data to track people's movements. Oh, wow. During Thanksgiving. Hmm. And they found that when people traveled from, you know, communities that voted heavily for one presidential candidate. Mm-hmm to visit relatives in areas that supported the other candidate, their visits were shorter. Shorter. Than the year before. Wow. So it's not just awkward political conversations at the dinner table. Right. It's actually impacting their behavior. Yeah. So families were literally cutting their visits short because of political differences. It makes you think. Yeah. It's really sad. Yeah. And fascinating at the same time. It shows that human development isn't just about individual psychology. Right. It's all embedded in these social and political contexts. Right. Our relationships, our communities, even the broader cultural climate all play a role. It makes you wonder, like, what other seemingly unrelated factors are mm -hmm. actually influencing our development without us even realizing it. Absolutely. And it leads us to this really central debate in the field of human development. Nature versus nurture. The age-old debate. I know, right? Yeah. Are we shaped by our genes or by our experiences? I feel like I've heard that my entire life. Me too. But I still don't know if I fully understand it. Well, you're not alone. Oh. It's a super complex issue. And for a long time, people saw it as like an either-or thing. Okay. But this chapter really emphasizes that it's not nature versus nurture. It's nature and nurture. Okay. They're constantly interacting and influencing each other. So it's like a dance where both partners are leading and following at the same time. Exactly. Our genes provide the blueprint, you know. Right. But our experiences... They really shape how that blueprint is expressed. So like a construction worker can have the blueprint, but yeah. the environment might change how that building actually gets built. Exactly. And the chapter uses this great analogy to illustrate this. Oh, I love a good analogy. 
It's the dandelion and orchid metaphor. Okay, you've got my attention. Okay. Am I a dandelion or an orchid? Well, think about dandelions. Okay. They're so resilient. Yes. They can thrive anywhere. Yeah, they're like weeds. Exactly. Whether it's a crack in the sidewalk or a lush garden, they're going to be fine. So are dandelions like people who have good genes? You could say that. And just kind of roll with the punches no matter what? Right. Okay, now think of orchids. Okay, orchids are very pretty and delicate. They are beautiful, but delicate. They need very specific conditions to flourish. Okay, so orchids are more like people who are sensitive to their environment. Exactly. Okay. This is the concept of differential susceptibility. Wow, that's a mouthful. I know, right? Mm. But all it means is that people vary in how sensitive they are to particular experiences. So someone who's like a dandelion might be able to handle stress yeah. without it having a huge impact. Right. Whereas someone who's like an orchid yeah. might be more vulnerable. Exactly. And this susceptibility can be influenced by both genes and previous experiences. Okay, so it's not just about having good or bad genes. Yeah. Right. It's about how those genes interact with the environment yes. and how that shapes who we become. Exactly. I'm learning so much today. I do. It's really cool. It's so fascinating. It has huge implications for how we understand human development. Yeah. Because we can't just look at someone's genes or their environment in isolation. Right. We have to consider this dynamic interplay between the two. Right. It's like trying to understand a cake by only looking at the flour. Exactly. They need all the ingredients. You need to see how it all comes together. Yeah. And that brings us to the lifespan perspective, which is all about understanding development across all stages of life. Ooh. Okay. I'm intrigued. Not just childhood. Yeah. Tell me more. So the lifespan perspective emphasizes that development, it's a lifelong process. Mm. It's full of twists and turns, gains and losses. It's multidirectional. So it's not just a straight line upward. No. Sometimes we might have setbacks. Exactly. We might gain skills in one area while losing ground in another or experience, you know, periods of rapid growth followed by plateaus. I feel seen. Right. It's reassuring to know that if I hit a rough patch, exactly, it doesn't mean I'm doomed. Exactly. I can still learn and grow. Absolutely. And another key principle of the lifespan perspective is that development is multi-contextual. But we touched on this a little bit with the Thanksgiving study. We did. But like, what other contexts are we talking about? Well, our development is shaped by so many contexts from our physical environment we grow up in to our family structure, socioeconomic status, right. cultural background, wow. even like the historical events that unfold during our lifetimes. It's a lot. It's a lot. To consider. It is. It makes me wonder if there are any universal truths right. about human development or if it's all just relative to like the context we live in. That's a great question. That's probably both. It's probably a little bit of both. Okay. You know, there's some fundamental aspects that seem to hold true across cultures. Yep. But the way those aspects are expressed can be very different depending on context. So it's like we all have the same basic building blocks. Yes. But the structures we create with those blocks yeah. could look totally different. Exactly. And yeah. that's why it's important to study human development from a multicultural perspective. I'm so glad you said that because that's what I was thinking about next. Perfect. It's really important to recognize that culture has a profound impact on how we develop. Yeah, for sure. And it's not just about national cultures either. Right. It's about all the different cultures we're part of. Ethnic cultures, family cultures, religious cultures, even like the culture of our peer group. Oh, yeah. It's like this tapestry of influences. Exactly. Each thread adding its own unique color and texture. And it means we need to be careful about making assumptions. Oh, yeah, for sure. Based on our own limited perspectives. Right. It's so easy to like judge other cultures. It is. Based on our own values. Yeah. And that can really blind us to like the richness and validity of other ways of being. Totally. The chapter actually talks about this. It's called the difference equals deficit error. Oh, wow. Which is this tendency to see anything different from our own culture as like somehow inferior or wrong. Oh, it's so true. Hmm. It's like that saying, don't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. Exactly. Yeah. Every culture has its own strengths and values. Right. And understanding those differences can really help us. Expand our horizons. Yes our understanding of human development. It makes you realize that what might be considered normal in one culture yeah. could be seen as totally different. Absolutely. And this brings us to another important principle of the lifespan perspective. It's multidisciplinary. Okay, so we've got multidirectional, 
multi-contextual, multicultural. You're seeing you're asking multidisciplinary. Multidisciplinary. I'm seeing a pattern here. I know, right? So all it means is that understanding human development requires insights from a lot of different fields, yeah. not just psychology. We need perspectives from biology, sociology, anthropology, neuroscience, economics, educate, linguistics. The list goes on. Oh, wow. It's like trying to solve a complex puzzle. Exactly. You need all the different pieces to see the complete picture. You got it. So, for example, take autism spectrum disorder. Okay. For a long time, it was viewed solely through the lens of psychology. Okay. But then genetics revealed, you know, there's a strong hereditary component. So it kind of shifted the understanding yeah. from just purely psychological to something that's also rooted in our genes. Exactly. But then on top of that, educators started realizing that children with ASD could learn you know, language and social skills yeah. with specialized support. So yeah. that brought in the expertise of the education field. Okay, so each discipline kind of adds another layer of understanding exactly. to create this richer picture. And now neuroscientists are exploring the brain structures involved in ASD. Right. Nutritionists are studying the role of diet public health experts are tracking the prevalence across different populations. It's truly a multidisciplinary effort. Yeah, it's amazing to see how all these different fields can kind of work together yeah. to shed light on something as complex as human development. Absolutely. And speaking of complexity, that brings us to the final principle of the lifespan perspective. Okay, hit me. Plasticity. Plasticity. Have you heard of this? I feel like I have, but I'm not really sure what it means. It, it's so cool. So plasticity refers to the incredible capacity for humans to change and adapt throughout their lives. Oh, so it's not like we're set in stone. No, we're not. Like we're not just a product of our genes or our childhood. Exactly. We have this amazing ability to learn new things, mm -hmm. develop new skills, even change ingrained habits. So our brains are basically like rewiring themselves. Yes. Based on what we're doing and exposed to. That's a great way to put it. And this plasticity, it's evident throughout the lifespan. Wow. So that's inspiring. It is. No matter what age we are, yeah. we can still continue to learn and grow and evolve. Oh. Absolutely. And this idea of plasticity is central to the dynamic systems approach to development. Okay. Remind me, what is the dynamic systems approach all about again? It basically views human development as this ongoing, ever-changing interaction between the body and mind and between each wow. person and every aspect of their environment. Okay. So it's about understanding how all these different systems work together. Right. So we're constantly in flux. Yes. Influenced by this complex web of factors. You got it. And to illustrate this, the chapter tells the story of your nephew, David. Oh, yes, David. <laughs> I think about him a lot. He's amazing. His life story is really a testament to the power of plasticity and the resilience of the human spirit. It really is. It showcases all five of these characteristics of the lifespan perspective that we've been talking about. Yeah, so multidirectional, multidisciplinary, multicontextual, multicultural, and, of course, plasticity. Right. So when he was born, things were pretty dire. Yeah, my sister-in-law, she contracted rubella while she was pregnant with him. And he was born blind with damage to his eyes, limbs, and brain. Oh, gosh. It was a really tough time. Yeah, I can imagine. And for years, his development, it seemed to kind of plateau. Yeah. But then when he was six, he had surgery to remove a cataract. Okay. It was like a switch flipped. Wow. He started reading at an advanced level, learning languages, excelling academically. That's incredible. Of course, there were still challenges. Yeah. He struggled socially, partly due to his disabilities. Understandably. And also because his schooling often kept him isolated. Right. That's so important. His story really highlights how important context is. Yeah. The social environments he was in, both at home and at school, really played a role. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because he grew up in Appalachia, uh -huh. where people tend to be more accepting of disabilities. Right. So I think that really helped him develop in a positive way. Yeah, for sure. And his experience with music was so powerful. It was incredible to watch. And it's funny, you know, when he was young, yeah. he was labeled intellectually disabled. Oh, wow. His IQ was quite low. Uh -huh. But as he got older, his IQ actually increased like dramatically. That's amazing. Far exceeding the average. What a testament to plasticity. It really is. It shows that human potential isn't fixed. Yeah. And with the right support and opportunities, people can overcome so much. He's now a successful translator. Wow. Living a full and independent life. That's so inspiring. It really is. And it leads us to another crucial aspect of studying human development, 
What's that? Research methods. Ah, research methods. The chapter really gets into the nitty gritty. I was going to say, because I feel like you can't talk about science without talking about yeah. how we actually study it. Yeah, so like with cross-sectional research. Oh yeah, where they compare different age groups. At a single point in time. Right. It seems efficient. Yeah. But it doesn't really tell us much about individual change. Exactly. And it can be really susceptible to what we call cohort effects. Cohort effects. Meaning that like the differences between age groups might just be because of Generational influence. Exactly. Not actual developmental changes. So if you're studying attitudes towards social media, yeah. you might find differences between teenagers and senior citizens. Yeah. But that could just be because they grew up in different times. Exactly. That's where longitudinal research comes in. Longitudinal following the same people. Over a long period of time. Okay. That's so valuable. It seems like that would be the gold standard. It's the best, but it also takes forever and it's expensive. Yeah. And people drop out. Yeah. There's challenges with every kind of research, it seems like. There are trade-offs with each method. The chapter also mentioned a third approach, cross-sequential research. Oh, yeah. It sounds like it's a combination of the two. It's a hybrid approach. Okay. combining cross-sectional and longitudinal. Oh, cool. It lets researchers really tease apart those effects of age cohort historical context, but it's even more complex. And expensive. And expensive. Yeah. No such thing as a free lunch in research. There isn't. But, okay, so we've got these different methods for studying development. Yeah. But it sounds like there are some really important things to keep in mind, too. For sure. Like, correlation doesn't equal causation. Absolutely. Just because two things are related doesn't mean that one causes the other. Yeah. Like, I remember reading that people who eat breakfast regularly tend to weigh less. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that eating breakfast causes weight loss. Right. There could be other things going on. Ex like, maybe people who eat breakfast are also just more health conscious in general. Yeah, or something like that. We never know. The chapter also talked about the difference between quantitative and qualitative research. Oh, yeah. Those are two very different approaches. Yeah, they are. But both are important. Yeah. So quantitative research deals with numbers That's, and yeah. statistics, right. which is great for comparing groups, testing hypotheses, identifying patterns. So good picture stuff. Yes. Big picture stuff. But maybe not so much for personal stories. Yeah, exactly. Qualitative research focuses on those narratives. Oh, good. The in-depth interviews, really understanding those lived experiences. So it's like the difference between reading a statistical report yeah. and listening to someone tell their life story. That's a perfect analogy. It seems like a balanced approach is key. It is. Using both to get the full picture. Absolutely. Like we need that wide angle lens and then that zoom lens to really grasp how complex this all is. Exactly. It's like having a toolbox full of instruments. Right. Each right. one is good for something different. This whole deep dive has really got me thinking about yeah. how we need to ask the right questions. Yeah. And use the right tools to find the answers. And it's not just about collecting data. Right. It's about understanding what it all means. Exactly. And speaking of unanswered questions. Yes. The chapter mentions that there's still a lot we don't know. Right. Like the long-term effects of prenatal drug exposure. Yeah. The complex factors that lead to poverty. Right. How to best support kids growing up in diverse family structures. Those are just a few examples, and it really highlights how much we still have to learn. Yeah. It's exciting, though. It is. Because those unanswered questions are basically opportunities. Totally. For new research. Absolutely. It's like we're standing on the edge of this vast, unexplored territory. I love it. Just things. waiting to be uncovered. Yeah. That sense of wonder and curiosity is what makes this field so compelling. It really does. It constantly challenges us and yeah. makes us rethink what it means to be human. It's definitely given me a new perspective. Me too. I'm walking away from this deep dive with a much better understanding of all this. I think one of the big takeaways is that human development, it's not a straight line. Right. It's this dynamic interplay of nature and nurture. Yes. It's shaped by so many contexts and it's full of continuity and change. It's like a tapestry. It is like a tapestry. Woven from all these threads of experienced genetics environment. And each person's tapestry is unique. It's beautiful. It is. So for our listeners who are like, okay, I want to learn more about this. Yeah. What's like one final thought you can leave them with? Don't be afraid to embrace the complexity. Oh, I love Don't that. shy away from those tough questions. Right. The gray areas, the things that make us uncomfortable. Because yeah. the more we learn about all of this, the more we realize how much there is still to discover. I think that's a perfect place to end it. Yeah. So on that note, we'll leave you with a challenge. Okay. What unanswered questions about human development are you curious about? Go out there, explore, 
be curious, and keep diving deep.